Thanks so much for being here. This is the second part of a four part reading of Alan Watts, the book from the chapter, The World is Your Body, but I'm gonna lovingly call it the rainbow. Here, he begins to break down the walls of separation by explaining that we, the observer or vibrational translator, are as much a part of the natural processes occurring on this planet as the natural processes themselves. It's a beautiful new way to think of uh, ourselves as connected to nature and everything that's happening around us. So I hope you enjoyed as much as I did. Here we go. A still more cogent example of existence as relationship is the production of a rainbow. For a rainbow appears only when there is a certain triangular relationship between three components, the sun, moisture in the atmosphere, and an observer. If all three are present, and if the angular relationship between them is correct, then and only then will there be a phenomenon rainbow. Diophanous as it may be, a rainbow is no subject, subjective hallucination. It can be verified, verified by any number of observers, though each will see it in a slightly different position. As a boy, I once chased the end of a rainbow on my bicycle and was amazed to find that it always receded. It was like trying to catch the reflection of the moon on the water. I did not then understand that no rainbow would appear unless the sun and I and the invisible center of the bow were on the same straight line so that I changed the apparent position of the bow as I moved. The point is then that an observer is in the proper position is as necessary for the manifestation of a rainbow as the other two components, the sun and the moisture. Of course, one could say that if the sun and a body of moisture were in the right relationship, say over the ocean, any observer on a ship that sailed into the line with them would see a rainbow. But one could also say that if an observer and the sun were correctly aligned, there would be a rainbow if there was moisture in the air. Somehow the first set of conditions seems to preserve the reality of the rainbow apart from an observer, but the second set, by eliminating a good solid external reality, seems to make it an indisputable fact that under such conditions there is no rainbow. The reason is only that it supports our current mythology to assert that things exist on their own, whether there is an observer or not. It supports the fantasy that man is not really involved in the world, that he makes no real difference to it, and that he can observe reality independently without changing it. For the myth of this solid and sensible world which is there, whether we see it or not, goes hand in hand with the myth that every observer is a separate ego, confronted with a reality quite other than himself. I had no idea that that's what was getting us so separate. And I've even said that so many times, one day the earth will just shake us off. And I love this idea, frankly, that we're important too, that we're connected to it too, that the way I observe things and the way I engage with things is just important to their existence as me. It wouldn't be here without me. There's something really cool about that. Perhaps we can accept this reasoning without too much struggle when it concerns things like rainbows and reflections whose reality status was never too high. But what if it dawns on us that our perception of rocks, mountains, and stars is a situation of just the same kind? There is nothing in the least unreasonable about this. We've not had to drag in any such spooks as mind, soul, or spirit. We've simply been talking of an interaction between physical vibrations and the brain with its various organs of sense saying only that creatures with brains are an integral feature of the pattern which also includes the solid earth and the stars, and that without this integral feature, or pole of the current, the whole cosmos would be as unmanifested as a rainbow without droplets in the sky or without an observer. Our resistance to this reasoning is psychological. It makes us feel insecure because it unsettles a familiar image of the world in which rocks above all are symbols of hard, unshakable reality and the eternal rock, a metaphor for God himself. The mythology of the 19th century had reduced man to an utterly unimportant little germ in an unimaginably vast and enduring universe. It is just too much of a shock, too fast a switch to recognize that this little germ with its fabulous brain is evoking the whole thing, including the nebulae, nebulae millions of light years away. Does this force us to the highly implausible conclusion that before the first living organism came into being equipped with a brain, there was no universe? 
that the organic and inorganic phenomenon came into existence at the same temporal moment? Is it possible that all geological and astronomical history is a mere extrapolation that is talking about that what we would have happened if it had been observed? Perhaps, but I will venture a more cautious idea. The fact that every organism evokes its own environment must be corrected with the polar or opposite fact that the total environment evokes the organism. Furthermore, the total environment or situation is both spatial and temporal, both larger and longer than the organisms contained in its field. Talking about a space-time reality, J. Bram says all the time, and even Neville Goddard talks about this, that there's a larger and longer sort of space and time field that we're in. The organism evokes knowledge of a past before it began and of a future beyond its death. At the other pole, the universe would not have started or manifested itself unless it was at the same time going to include organisms. Just as current will not begin to flow from the positive end of a wire until the negative terminal is secure. The principle is the same, whether it takes the universe billions of years to polarize itself in the organism, or whether it takes the current one second to traverse a wire 186,000 miles long. I repeat that the difficulty of understanding the organism environment polarity is psychological. The history and the geographical distribution of the myth are uncertain, but for several thousand years, we've been obsessed with a false humility. On the one hand, putting ourselves down as mere creatures who came into the world by the whim of God or the fluke of blind forces. And on the other, conceiving ourselves as separate personal egos fighting to control the physical world. I don't only have two options. It's so weird. We have lacked the real humility of recognizing that we are members of the biosphere, the harmony of contained conflicts in which we cannot exist at all without the cooperation of plants, insects, fish, cattle, and bacteria. In the same measure, we've lacked the proper self-respect of recognizing that I, the individual organism, am a structure of such fab fabulous ingenuity that it calls the whole universe into being. And this is interesting. I was just reading in The Course of Miracles about our false humility, that we think putting ourselves down is a form of humility, where he has and it talks about the right form of humility, which is understanding that you have a big purpose. And he's getting at that here, which is fascinating that we sort of have this false type of humility that we're just pieces of crap. But true humility is really understanding that we are a structure of such fabulous ingenuity that it calls the whole universe into being. It's very interesting how it resets us. In the act of putting everything at a distance so as to describe and control it, we have orphaned ourselves both from the surrounding world and from our bodies, leaving I as a disconnected and alienated spook, anxious, guilty, unrelated, and alone. He nails it. And he's not even talking about the spiritual side of it. It amazes me. He just analyzes it from science and nails it, saying the exact same thing that anyone coming from the spiritual idea of separation and the damaging patterns of guilt or... Um, Where did it just say? Anxious, guilty, unrelated, and alone. So fear, anxious is fear, separated, alone, guilty, powerless, everything at the bottom of the vibrational scale, unworthy. It's fascinating. And he's getting there specifically just from really the scientific view of your brain and the organism going on around us, which I just find so brilliant. We have attained a view of the world and a type of sanity which is dried out like a rusty beer can on the beach. It is a world of objects, of nothing buts, as ordinary as a formica table with chromium fittings. We find it immensely reassuring, except that it won't stay put, and must therefore be defended even at the cost of scouring the whole planet back to a nice clean rock. For life is, after all, a rather messy and gooey accident in our basically geological universe. If a man's son asks for bread, will he give him a stone? The answer is probably yes. Yet this is no quarrel with scientific thinking, which as of this date has gone far, far beyond Newtonian billiards and the myth of the fully automatic mechanical universe of mere objects. That was where science really got its start. But in accordance with William Blake's principle that the fool who persists in his folly will become wise, 
the persistent scientist is the first to realize the obsolescence of old models of the world. And so the next chapter, which is the second part, is so what? <laughs> so he's established this different version sort of of the universe, but so what? Thank you for being here. I hope you enjoyed it. I really, really appreciate you, just so you know. Obviously, this wouldn't be happening without you, the observer, to receive it. <laughs> so it's a happening that's happening together, and you must be calling forth this information as much as my questions are. And hopefully you've gotten a cool little tickle in your brain like I do from this. <laughs>